Hello everyone, welcome back to the Tej Talks podcast. Now, oh God, the audience, wow, live audience people, just so much appreciation for the podcast. Now, uh, I'm here today with D Ludlow, you're probably very familiar with him, been on my podcast three or four times before, obviously you're a key supplier at the property event, um, which obviously everyone who's listening needs to be there. Well, you're not though, are you? Because there's thousands of you listening and there's only eight of you at the event, but you should be. Um, we're going to talk about quite uh, quite an important topic today and a topic that's very relevant. We're recording this on the 22nd of March. You're probably going to hear this this week. And it's about what the F is happening in the world um, from a financial view, because I'm sure we both have other views. We could be here for hours. But from a financial, from a um, investing, from a protect yourself, because ain't nobody else going to do it type of view. So D, right now, Russia still invading Ukraine, still, you know, I won't say his name because I feel like the red dot is going to appear on my forehead. So, you know, next man is is doing bad things. Um, that's obviously affected the markets. It affected the Russian markets quite a lot. Uh, you've got crypto, which has been in what some might say a bear market for a while, or it's been going sideways. Stocks aren't exactly popping. Um, fuel fucking ev- everything like my my apples have gone up you know like it's it's mad how do you feel what's your sentiment towards the world and market right now um i think it's very uncertain so i think we need to look at the root cause of all of it really we don't want to go too political on this but you know if you look at um from the geopolitics for instance like ukraine for instance they top trading partners uh China and Germany I think they make up over about 20 billion between them and I think 65 percent ish of Ukraine's GDP um in the COVID year 2020 was from international trade so we've been seeing a shift towards sort of independence from Russia for about 20 years now and they're moving more towards western trading partners anyway apart from the fact that China was made up of some of that as well um but I would say if we look at who's supporting so um the support that Ukraine have received through this. So the people that support them are going to be most likely be their sort of biggest trade partners going forward. Um, I think the EU's committed to about I don't know, half a billion or something in financial support. God knows where they got that from. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, um, you know that, that, and from the back of this and all the sort of geopolitical uncertainty, which we've been seeing for well before this anyway, with China and the US, like it's, it's caused a lot of stir in markets, you know, Gas prices in the US are at all time highs. Um, and I did read something that said that this recent sort of surge in prices is um, could add around $2,000 per annum to the cost of an average American household. Um, but, you know, people don't talk about this. Um, like California, I think the prices are above $5 a gallon now. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And I think another thing that we've seen through this to move towards some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about in regards to taking full custody of your money and, and how to protect yourself is, you know, look at how easily people become deplatformed in the world, um, whether that's by our banking system or big tech. Um, look at like sort, sort of what they've done to Russia. Um, like the av- average Russian citizen doesn't really have a say in what's going on, right? You know, um, it's not everyone's in Russia's sort of campaigning to invade Ukraine. So the average Russian citizens are getting punished and being deplatformed based on what, you know, the Russian government decide to do or whatever's going on behind closed doors. And then we're talking about, well, we'll deplatform them from all the big tech banking um, out of the SWIFT messaging system. But the whole thing with SWIFT, which, you know, don't want to go too deep down the rabbit hole in regards to the petrodollar. But looking at the SWIFT payment system, that's not the end of the world for Russia not to be have access to that. Like Russia and China already have their own alternative to the SWIFT messaging system. It's not like the end of the world that they can't access that. Um, and then looking at how commodities have been very, very strong. Um, you know, I've seen a few articles on people now looking at commodities as a potential store of value. Like hopefully not. Because one, we don't really want to use them as a store of value because we usually need commodities, and two, they're not really for. Uh, it's not really ideal for an investor to stack, you know, barrels of oil or wheat. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, you've got to look at it from a few um, sort of uh, perspectives in regards to Russia, Ukraine, then looking deep 
back to the petrodollar system and and the protect them how they protect the petrodollar system and you know sanctions that we've seen have a place if dollar remains king so when we see sanctions yeah they have their place but if dollar isn't king anymore and the sanctions become irrelevant. People start pricing barrels of oil in, in, in different currencies, which we're already seeing. We've seen what happens to countries if they try and do that, um, if we look at history. So when you're looking at even recent comments from Jerome Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, saying that, you know, it, someone asked him, is he open to a potential another um, reserve currency outside of the dollar? And he was like, well, yeah, that could happen as well. So we're seeing a, quite a bit of a shift already um, in regards to where the power is moving and the, the control is moving. But yeah, overall, I'm sure we're going to get into more in depth on different asset classes. But I think the Russia-Ukraine situation, first and foremost, is um, yeah, is is quite uncertain. It's hard to navigate the market. Also, I do feel that the markets have now quite heavily priced in war and even rate hikes and even inflation. The market still reacts quite you know volatile to like new news that comes out but i feel a lot of stuff's priced in um to the market now i think it's yeah we're already seeing um the changes in in prices in the market and you know it, when anything happens people like to blame it for everything so when covid happened oh i can't do my job anymore covid sorry you know we've got six month lead times what does that even fucking mean? And now the DVLA, you know, there's still everyone, people are still doing it, right? And it's like, and it, solicitors had the best time because they actually had a kind of ish reason, not really for them for being so slow. Um, and I feel like it's the same thing now with, you know, the increased price of petrol and price of food, of heating. Everyone maybe just clings to and says, oh yeah, it's, um, it's Russia and Ukraine. Is this the real reason for all of this stuff or was this happening long before and is it inflation related? Yeah, I think that it was happening anyway. Um, you know, again, not to go too deep, but the long term debt cycle that we've covered a few times on this. Um, the question is, you know, how sustainable is it? How long can it keep going on for? You know, it's actually quite hilarious to watch what the Fed actually puts out. Um, like first they said inflation was transitory. Um, then they said that we won't see a slowdown in economic growth if we rate uh, if we have rate hikes and inflation continues. Um, and then they said that wage growth is very strong and household balance sheets are healthy too. Um, like at what point do people just stop listening to what the Fed say? Like like how markets still react to what they say? I, I understand this. There's going to be an element of, of course, you have to price it in. But you know, let's look at it. So if if wage growth is strong. Um, okay, let's sort of overlay a wage growth chart to inflation and then let's see how strong wages are. Um, because like we've said previously, people focus on the price of wages over price of goods, um, you know, more frequently, which, you know, that's when people get caught out. Um, then they said economic growth won't slow down. All right, let's remove the false economy that's being created and let's see how good um, economic growth is then. Then inflation being transitory, you know, I don't think we need to comment on that because they've already retired the transitory inflation narrative. Um, but if you look at a few of the things that they're putting out, like look, the 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 thirty year mortgage rates now above four percent in the US, right? So either house prices need to start to change and slightly adjust, or where are people going to be buying to live? Like you know, you think a car park space in London's expensive? Let's People are going to be living out in sheds in LA if if the if this keeps going the way it's going. Um, but look, he actually thinks the economy's strong and he thinks that it can cope with tighter financial conditions. I, I you know, I, I don't think it can um, personally. Um, let's just take a look at a few things. Like I think ninety seven percent of all money that is out there is debt. Um, if we look at some central banks like Japan, the central bank owns eighty percent of their stock market. Um, the global derivatives market is one quadrillion or about, I think it was one quadrillion in 2008. So, you know, when you look at, um, I know we covered this on the mastermind, looking at, um, when you look at them numbers in seconds, I think one million seconds is, uh, was it like um, 12 days? I think one billion is like 32 years and then one trillion is like 33 and a half thousand years, which is like, 
like going back to 29,000 BC. <laughs> and then when you try and fathom what a quadrillion is, which is a thousand trillion, it's really hard to put, to even imagine the sort of numbers, you know, that that's like 10 times um, the global economy. So the debt cycle it is hard, like it is hard to decide how sustainable is this. How long is it going to be? Are they going to maintain pushing this along? Are we going to see some sort of debt restructure? Like you know, in normal sort of macro, you think that we're definitely going to see some sort of global crash or pretty bad depression or recession. But then you know, the longer they're pushing it along, and it's hard to say. Like you know, you look at everything. Global supply chains are in are in bits. Nothing's really actually in real life looking good um if, if nothing was propped so um you know looking at the the current credit cycle um so for listeners who, who may not know what this is this is where they build the debt up in the economy then it'll get cleared through insolvency or bankruptcies um you know each time the sort of debt to gdp gets bigger um, they just lower interest rates every single time, makes the cost of borrowing cheaper each time, which makes the debt a lot easier to surface, service if you can, if it's sustainable, right? Um, but once rates pretty much get to zero, there's nowhere else that you can really go. You know, they've sort of exhausted the, the tool of lowering rates. Um, they've tried to keep the magical 2% inflation. Um, this hasn't happened either. And it just makes the money and business sort of everything become slightly unsustainable. Um, it just gets higher and higher. Like the central bank can't just let debt bankrupt the economy because then the entire system's at risk, right? Um, but look at the Fed the Fed fund rate now. You know, it's, it's in total disconnection to inflation. It, it sort of has been since 2008. But if you look at inflation and the Fed fund rate, it, they, they're totally disconnected. And then when a country's debt to GDP gets close to 100% or even 80% really, the country's central bank just ends up buying most of the debt. So look at what the Fed's been doing. Like They've been sending billions of dollars every single week on buying mortgage-backed securities and all other things as well. Um, there just isn't enough money really in the private sector um, that wants to keep buying at those low rates. So then central bankers need to keep creating money and keep buying the bonds. Um, but looking at what's sustainable, looking at the Fed's balance sheet, if they were for, to, say, forgive half or a third of the treasuries or just even a fraction of them, then they would be insolvent on their balance sheet. So, you know, we're basically, it's a very interesting time and concerning time because we're basically printing money into inflation. Like, that's clearly not sustainable, right? It's like saying, you know, if, if, if a plane was going to crash into the ground at 500 miles an hour, is it better to be in first class or economy? That's that's kind of the question that we're being asked to to, to answer at the moment. So yeah, it's, it's 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 quite scary at the moment and concerning. And who knows, you know, whether there's going to be debt jubilee or something. It's hard to say. And yeah, I mean, still definitely first class. Um, but <laughs> go out in style, think, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and when they find me, they'll be like, yeah, yeah, your boy was your boy was traveling well. <laughs> um, when so you kind of mentioned a few things there and it is like a kind of crashing plane. And I think at least on the property side, it's been happening for over a year now. Overinflated prices, things going crazy, very, very hard to find good deals. There's a lot of money out there that's going into property and other assets. Um, and, you know, combine that with inflation, which, you know, you mentioned the US statistics there. I can't remember. I don't know what the UK ones are, but, you know, it's taking a chunk off our money every year every month the bills petrol everything and I, i'm seeing it already i'm like i didn't like what this is my tesco shop and i'm like but i've got less like what i'm I'm just like shivering away losing all weight man there's no food to feed me no petrol in the car what is this gonna lead to do you think because what i'm just thinking about is listeners are thinking oh is there gonna be a crash are we, you know what do you think and again you can't you know you haven't got crystal ball you know we're predicting off current events and past data but you know what um, or less maybe a better question is what are some of the maybe different scenarios briefly that you think could play out if any based on what we're seeing and this living crisis that we're in um the real answer is i don't know um but if i was to guess um 
I think America will lose global reserve currency status. Um, I think they know that's going to happen. Um, I think that we'll probably move to like a multi-reserve currency, a bit like the SDR at the IMF, where there's like a basket of different currencies, potentially might add some commodities in there. Like maybe gold will be in there, maybe Bitcoin, who knows. Um, so I think that's one option. And then some sort of debt restructure or debt jubilee to what they can afford. But at the moment, I think it's the amount they're printing. I think there's like a between 50 or 60 million gap between the Fed already being insolvent or not. So I don't, there's not a lot of room. Um, I think that it all depends on if we ever see um, America even have a, a light default on their debt. Um, I think that would really shake up the system. But I think that we're probably going to see them lose global reserve currency status. I think you've got China who's already actively um, using CBDCs. Um, and I think that with their influence in places like South America and Africa, I think they could bank a lot of unbanked people quite easily if they allow them to download their app. I think that they're already moving towards that. We're seeing that they're potentially pricing barrels now in Yuan. So I think this that's the one scenario. And then there's going to be a bit of a reset in the financial system because it's going to, the sort of power moves to somebody else. Um, plus everything that China has been doing um, over the past sort of 20, 30 years as well. Um, then an, a, a, a pr pretty deep recession is another um, option. You know, is, I don't think anyone can write that off. Is you know, if, if any, if there's anything that's going to cause a recession, uh, or if we're head, if any indicators showing a recession, we're heading towards that way now. So I think that's another one. I think you know, um, you know, credit lines will probably freeze up. Um, you know, if things aren't sustainable, they're not going to keep giving people money. Um, and people say that money, there's loads of money flowing around. It's easy to get access to. Well, yeah, like credit card credit's easy. Like <laughs> to get once you get it, they'll let you spend with those 22, 28 <laughs> percent interest rates. Of course they will. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's another option. Um, but moving moving to the house prices a sec. Um, you know, the thing is, I, I was at an event a few weeks ago, um, or I think it was last week, actually. And one of the things that someone mentioned, the speaker mentioned, was um, this housing crisis, this long-term housing crisis that we have in the UK, right? And that he was mentioning, you know, he's built a, a, an incredible business in park homes. It was Alfie Best. Um, and, you know, you know, he's obviously built a huge amount of wealth from it. And he sort of said that that, that was the solution potentially to our UK housing crisis long term but I don't think we we have a long term housing crisis personally um the reason why I don't think this is yes we don't build enough houses per year the media tells us that all the time to keep keep up with population but since like the 60s global fertility rates have been cut in half so obviously this is going to have um part of this is going to be because of birth control and you know societal shifts and cost of childcare probably too <laughs> uh, uh, but th this is the same time this is happening basically the same time as millions of people are opting out the labor force right which means we have an increase in sort of elderly dependent population which that in itself can cause economic problems um you know healthcare costs could strain resources um job sort of production slow down um but then from the tech side of stuff, I think that we can look forward to like robotics solving the sort of the burden, as people call it, on sort of healthcare and the resources in healthcare, just all of tech, really, you know. Um, but the same time, sort of people are having less babies, we now have, you know, this sort of long term housing crisis. So people are having less babies, then we got the growth of tech in like 3D print construction. So I don't think we're going to continue to have this housing problem, as they say. Uh, modular builds already speed up the process, reduce material and labor costs. Um, you know, 3D print is going to be like a rocket version of modular, in my opinion. So I think basic maths would say that in population is in decline and technology is growing faster than anything in history, then the housing crisis could potentially um, become more... Uh, I think the solution's already there. Um, I think, yes, it's going to take time because of... The, how long they'd like to take with like legislation and stuff <laughs> it takes forever um but i don't think that we're in a situation as bad as people think i think it's definitely an easy thing for um people that maybe 
property educators or people that are in property to look for the confirmation bias to say, I need to keep building this and doing this because population's getting out of control and we've got no houses to house people. And I just don't think it's the case. I think that, you know, definitely we're going to become more of a renting nation, I believe, um, like Germany and Belgium and some of the other countries in Europe. I do believe that, but I don't think that, you know, people like, you know, yourself, as an investor, me, um, James, like doing HMOs. I think we're already seeing um, a lot of sort of families now going back quite old school, living together, and obviously HMOs. So I, I just don't think we have the housing crisis as people like to make out. So yeah, I, I, I think that there's a lot of stuff in the media. And I think that first and foremost, if this probably did start back in um, 2008 financial crisis, when we started to see the real rich people stay rich, not go to prison and just continue doing what they're doing. Um, nothing happened. I think that people start to lose sort of faith in the media slightly then. Um, and then I think 2020 <laughs> definitely woken people up to what, you know, information is being told to them. So I think that the best thing to do going forward is one, really be careful where you get your information. It's hard to know what's real and what's not and how bad something is compared to if it isn't bad. And two, just really um, taking on board that and challenging the opposite opinion because you can turn on one news channel. America's worse for this than the UK, but you can turn on Fox News and CNN and get two different stories and like, or, or, or the bias is leaned towards one over the other. So I, I definitely feel that people need to really open their mind and challenge their opinion. Don't just listen to one person and be like, well, this is the way to do it. Think of like the other, uh, the other way and then go with like what you feel would be better because it's, it's so easy to just take on board what somebody's saying. Nobody is an expert in everything. Like there is no one who's an expert in everything. It's just opinion driven. Everything's opinion driven. The, you know, the fiat currency system is a confidence based system is opinion driven. As long as we have an opinion and that we have confidence in it, then it's fine. If we have an opinion that house prices are going to keep going up and everybody's on board with their opinion, then fine. As long as the banks are on board providing credit, it's fine. If as long as cryptocurrency has the opinion that people believe Bitcoin's going to go to six figures and seven figures and beyond, then that's fine. But everything is an opinion driven system and you need to challenge the opposite so you don't get caught out that's the way that's what i would say interesting yeah i think as you mentioned earlier it is uncertain and it's something that i don't know i've not seen before i think a lot of people haven't experienced a war or something of this kind mm. um before obviously there's lots of wars that have gone on which haven't got as much support but anyways i'll save that for a different podcast mm. um i think you know, you kind of mentioned it a bit earlier about the control and people being deplatformed. Obviously, we're seeing with these oligarchs, some of the richest people in the world just get frozen, literally like frozen in ice. And it's like, so even having all this money don't mean shit um, because you'll just get clapped when it comes to it. So um, what are your kind of thoughts, I suppose, then, you know, moving forward? You know, how do I mean, look. I assume there's no oligarchs listening to this. If there are, then, you know, you can loan me a couple mil if you want. Some deals. <laughs> uh, but generally speaking, the everyday person, you know, how do we protect our investments um, and any sort of general words of wisdom in that arena moving forward, given what's happening to people and given how volatile things can be or are? Yeah. So firstly, I think to really put, to really back, look at the big picture here of how like this sort of deplatforming and the controls becoming, you know, it's quite easy to sort of um, touch on the tinfoil hat um, situation with this. But it's, if you look at just facts, right, rather than go deep into it, just, you know, I know we've mentioned this on podcast previously, but we're seeing more of a use case, more and more for crypto, um, looking at sort of capital controls as well, like C Canada freezing accounts, um, Russia raising interest rates to 20% to incentivize savers to try and deposit into their bank um, so they avoid a bank run. Um, that's why capital controls are in place. We've seen it in Greece before. Um, we've seen it a lot. And we're, it's, it's not a thing where people don't even get like um, surprised anymore. You know, it's, it's like, okay, cool, they're freezing my account. Um, yeah, it's like, it's, it's crazy how this situation in Canada, Russia and and everywhere else, I'm, I'm like, people really just okay with this. Like, not that they're okay, but like, why aren't we like, 
really speaking out more. The whole world just should be speaking out. You work hard like every single day. You pay like taxes on you know your income. You get paid taxes on everything you buy. Like it's, it's insane to think then that they can just be like, well, we're just going to hold your money for the moment because we've created a fractional reserve banking system that you know the the money that you want. Sorry, we can't access right now because we don't have it. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to limit what you can withdraw and we're going to hold the rest. Because if everyone wants to withdraw, then we're, we're screwed. So like, I, I, it's crazy to me that people just, we see a media article about this for like two days and then we move on to the next thing and it's just been forgotten about. I just find it crazy. So the use case on sort of, say, Bitcoin initially is, is, is literally a big light shine on it right now. And um, not just because of capital controls and protection and taking self-custody that I'll talk to about you in a sec, is looking at internet penetration rates across the world. If you just, you can Google this. Um, I think the top one is Morocco. We've got 36 million people, 71% of the population's unbanked, but they've got a 62% uh, pen internet penetration rate. So we've got all these people, billions of people unbanked, um, but they all got access to the internet and probably smartphones. So they can bank themselves with cryptocurrency. They don't need to rely on a bank, a, a, the bank as we know it. And, you know, th this is just how it is. Um, you know, I, I was talking to someone the other day. Um, it, it, actually, I was talking to self, which is about crypto emerging Crypto in the metaverse. Man just said, I was talking to Selvages, you know. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. Wow. And afterwards, one of their staff members came up to me and was like, I was on about Nexo, which we'll talk about in a sec, and which I know you're a big fan of. Um, you need a referral code, I think, Tej. Um, yeah, do, but, yeah. but she was like, well, well, I can just get the Nexo card and I can just put my money in there and I can basically earn 12% on my pounds and not have to buy crypto. I was like, yeah. She's like, well... Why, I don't, why have I got a bank? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. You need to ask yourself the sad question. And I think where we see now, especially like the generation that, uh, like the teenage generation now, how tech savvy they are. Like we think we're tech savvy, right? And we, like our parents are like, well, how do you use this and this? And how are you podcasting? And and like, can you imagine like the, how tech savvy these the gen next generation are? And just looking at sort of even um, wealth sort of by industry and, and generation, like millennials, I think millennial billionaires, most of their wealth technology, right? Which is, I think is pretty obvious. I think, oh, I think a third of millennial billionaires are actually tech billionaires. Um, whereas if you look back at the baby boomer, boomer generation, they was predominantly wealthy from just finance and say manufacturing. So we're already seeing that shift anyway. So the next generation, like, they, they're going to be even more tech savvy. So when we like, when we sort of, well, I'm not sure how this is going to be part of our system and our day-to-day. -day. It's like, well, you know, you probably didn't expect five, six, seven years ago that you could leave your house without any cash or any bank card and buy something in the shop with your phone through Apple Pay. Like People would have been like, really? I don't, can't see that happening in that, that amount of time. And like when people say, well, I don't understand blockchain or I don't understand the tech behind it, it's like, well, you don't need to. Like you don't understand the tech behind Apple Pay. Like you don't, like I said this, an example before, you don't wake up one day and just be like, right, I need to work on my Apple Pay strategy because I'm going to go down the shop and buy like a can of Coke today. I need to work out how I'm going to transfer the money and make the transaction. Like we just do it because it's normal. Just like you pay on card, you don't question it, you just do it. So blockchain is just going to be a thing that we just use day to day. You don't need to understand the technology. You just It's just going to happen. We don't understand how cross-border payments work now. So we don't, you know, why, why would we need to understand how blockchain cross-border payments work? So for me, with, with moving towards central bank digital currencies, which comes back to the control, and then we'll go into how we can protect ourselves, um, 81 countries that basically represent 90% um, of global GDP are already exploring central bank digital currencies. So this isn't a thing where it's like, well, we're, you know, the, the, the Bank of England and the Fed are just toying with the idea. Like they're all exploring central bank digital currencies. Now, it's more than likely that they probably won't be on a blockchain. They're probably going to be on a DLT, which is distributed ledger technology. Um, probably won't be on a blockchain, but a DLT can be blockchain based or not blockchain based. It's basically just like a master spreadsheet. Um, so imagine having like Google Sheets and all the transactions are on there. Um, it's probably going to be like that sort of base system. Probably I've just I've, I was reading while they're doing an MIT and they're going to test the Fed coin there first, and that's sort of what they're leaning towards. They're obsessed with this DLT. Um, 
that sort of terminology. <laughs> so um, that's sort of what they're probably going to do. So it might not even be blockchain based. And looking at CBDCs and how this debt is spiraled out of control with fractional reserve banking, after 2008, they was meant to hold 10% reserve requirement on bank deposits. Um, but crazy, what's crazy about this situation is they could actually borrow the reserve deposit from another bank, which, which <laughs> again, like, exactly. So, but then Mar- it was only the states that did this. Um, but in March 2020, they was take they took those reserve requirements away anyway because they obviously wanted to turn the printer on and they didn't want a hold back anyway. Um, but yeah, look, the the, the central bank digital currencies it, they are going to be like quite con- very controlling like if you think of right now the way things are going on um looking at tax automation um all your data and transactions are going to be controlled through you know artificial intelligence they've already mentioned that they're going to have this sort of programmable money that they the issuer gets to decide what the receiver spends the money on um so if they do this through say universal basic income which obviously been banging on about for a few years but um you know if they get to say like look look ted you can have you know thousand pounds a month um and you know you have to spend it within four weeks um but you have caps on things you can spend it on so you know you go to the petrol station one day and you fill your car up and you're like sorry Dej, you've done too many miles this month um in this car and you've already hit the cap on your the amount of petrol you spent this month sorry come back on this date or you know Ted, you spent too much money on wine this month or with you would be cheese you spent way too much money on cheese this month sorry you have to come back next month so then they can decide to program this and how the receiver spends it so in this case they can now control demand because they can see what's pu- what's actually purchased so if they control who's getting credit in the economy and they decide who gets what then they can decide little things or say little the big things like who can expand their business where you can spend your money so when and also you put tax automation in there then you know that removes quite a few jobs too from you know bookkeepers for instance like let's be fair they, they unfortunately bookkeepers was eventually going to get replaced with technology regardless you know they're replacing you know even more higher skilled jobs than that already um there's software that can do this now um as well so you know there's ubi is going to just be introduced as a benefit like download our app bank with the central bank and this is what you get you either get i don't know 500 quid for downloading the app you have to spend it in this time or it's going to be um you know you get it every single month or whatever but they can they're going to be able to cut you out the system whenever they want and they could potentially limit you to certain um, parts of the system as well um, and look when I say like people are trying to flood to gold and silver right and you know I'm, I'm a sort of I hold both as well physical gold and silver I think I am bullish bullish on silver long term based on this use case but um, if, if you try and escape the system and buy gold or silver right you're not going to go in your shop with a bar of gold and try and swap it for your shopping right so you're not going to go down the local car dealership and say can I have the Tesla use a bar of gold it's not going to happen so if you did try and escape the system with say traditional stuff like gold or silver then what if they start charging you massive fees to transfer it back into the CBDC then have you really escaped the system or have you just put yourself in a worse position so is you know is preserving your wealth like there's literally there's only one option like the bank only becomes at risk if it needs something that it can't create like gold like bitcoin so like and if they can if they can still control a bit of the monopoly with gold in regards to if you need to transact with something in our system then we'll charge you heavily to do so then what there's only one other option which is, is cryptocurrency, a Bitcoin mainly because is is technically it it is actually decentralized. We because we don't know the owner, right? So, um, but then if you look at then what um, in regards to payment gateways and and global settlements, when you look at like what Jack Malice has done at Strike, like you know I, I mentioned this a lot because I think it's incredible what he's done. Um, he's now it's it's a global sort of settlement network with no borders. There's no sort of credit. No delayed settlements. We have instant finality as well. Um, you don't actually require any identification to the participants. Um, so, you know, it's open source, permissionless, no jurisdiction. It's like an open sort of monetary network that 
can settle any amount of value, anytime, any place, pretty much at no cost through the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Like, why would anyone even need to go anywhere else? You know, so it, it, it go looking towards Bitcoin and and looking at maybe yeah maybe it's not a store of value right now. You know, because it is volatile. You know, maybe we have to look at it in another light. But as a monetary network and a settlement network, it's perfect. So going back to banking yourself and like using Nexo, which I know you use, I use. Um, you can get an Exo card. You can earn, you know, like, I'm not going to say that, but um, you can earn sort of 12% interest on your pounds if you don't want to even buy cryptocurrency. Like, why would you want to bank with the bank at those base rates with inflation? Where is that? Like, let's be fair. We don't know. It's deep into double figures, to be fair. We don't know where inflation's really at. It may be plus 20, 25% for all we know, um, because of how the CPI gets calculated. So you can, with cryptocurrency, you can bank yourself, you can take full custody of your personal wealth. So, you know, we know when we put money in the bank, they become the legal owner the second we deposit. We know that the Queen owns all the land in the UK. So if they did want to take your house back, they can. Whether they will or not, probably unlikely, but they can if they want to. They can they can do whatever they can add and take away any taxes they want with property. The good news is a lot of the MPs are property investors. So, you know, that's that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, and, and your goal, what if they start taxing you or, or charging you high fees? Sorry, um, if, if it comes back into the system. So stock market, same thing. Like who's who's in control of the stock market? So, you know, it, it's like, where do you where do you go? Like, where do you go to, to, to be actual? Like, well, look, I actually got some sort of control over my wealth. The only way you can possibly do this, because you can't can't go and stack loads of cash in suitcase under your bed because we're losing purchasing power with it and cash is going so the only way you can really do it is use something like bitcoin it's, it's, it's not a thing of like becoming a bitcoin maxi because i'm not you know i i like to challenge the opposite opinion but the if you actually look at everything and weigh it all up there is this is the only place you can actually own your money and if you you know if you appreciate and you're grateful for the time and effort you put in to get it, I think you should be able to own your money. There shouldn't be someone who can take it off you. Mm. Yeah, some really good points there. And I think it is so normal that, yeah, things get frozen or, oh, account doesn't work or like, oh, the banks are at it again or, oh, look, they got fined for this or like, <clears throat> it's so normal for them to have that level of control because, of course, they enforce it and reinforce it through the media, through their behavior, through cultural things, through just, ah, you know, typical MPs. Like, you know, you look at what any of these MPs have done and the fraud and the corruption and the things they've said. It's like you ask anyone in England, they're pretty much going to say, oh, yeah, standard. Yeah, Boris did that. Yeah, no surprise. Like you could go up to someone, make something up and they'll be like, oh, I didn't hear that. Did he do that? Oh, mad. Yeah, like I'd be like, <laughs> I'd be like, oh, really? That's not that bad, to be fair. I'm sure he's done worse. And mm. I think when you step back and really look at it, there is obviously the control, the things being fed to us. And yeah, in America, the news is just like, is mad. It's, no wonder they're so dumb and they just believe anything. Like, just the news is it's hilarious. Like, um, we won't go into that. But yeah, that's a really good point with crypto. Because as you were talking through that, before you said crypto, I was kind of thinking, well, it is it is the kind of answer to that question because everything else has an element of control and crypto doesn't yet obviously hopefully not but who knows where it'll be in the future mm. but it is increasingly hard to actually control your money when you're in a system that really controls your money and you spend it in the system because you don't have a choice and you know so yeah that's that's a that, there's a lot to think about there and i think people listening it might put things into perspective for them about the reality of the life we live. Um, and just to wrap up then, because, you know, we're talking about crypto. Crypto has been interesting, should we say, for the past X many months. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we had a really nice run last year. Um, I know your, your, um, your 20, I forgot what it's called. Because uh, I know they had a name change. Now we're back. Um, we're back. We're back. You're back. Yes. Crypto twenty. Crypto twenty. We're back. Your crypto twenty is up <laughs> like hundreds of percent. Yeah. So I do appreciate with the right picks at the right time, you know, people are still in the money, but a lot of people are not. Mm. Um, what are your thoughts on crypto? I'm not going to ask for a prediction because, like you said, who who bloody knows? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it'll change by the time we stop recording this. <laughs> but generally, 
people are, if people are panicking, if people are, oh, I'm in the red, any advice or just mindset or just STFU for people to just chill? Like, what are you thinking? So obviously there's not no financial advice. Um, yep. But um, yeah, I think that, you know, like I popped in the Discord yesterday, I think people um, will thank themselves later if they hold on, obviously providing you're in something um, that has active development and it's going to be your dogecoin obviously yeah yeah, yeah. Love Doge. no don't <laughs> so, don't take that advice no no so yeah you've got to be careful where you're in but I, I do believe looking at crypto now like you know gaming is going to explode you know it's already had huge gains um but if you look at say you know microsoft and what 68 or 69 billion acquisition of um activision um so i think it shows the direction that's going in um facebook's acquired oculus roblox um obviously changed the name to meta um I think actually like 10 out of 15, 10 out of the 15 biggest gaming acquisition acquisitions have happened in I think the last two years or three years maybe. So I think gaming's huge and I think is, is, a, is a key and pivotal part of the metaverse and the cross between um, like real virtual or digital worlds and real world um, in regards to advertising and, and, and AR, VR. So I think that gaming's huge. So looking at some of the gaming tokens, um, if you go to like Mazari, you can look at um, like the top projects from different sectors, which helps um, as you can start like researching them. Um, I also think that the layer ones have a lot left in the tank too. So I think like Solana, um, Polkadot, um, Avalanche, Terra Luna, um, I do think like ETH is growing a little too fast for developers to keep up, in my opinion. I, not, not that I don't, I'm not bullish on ETH because I am. Um, but, you know, the the sort of increased network activity and, and, and the huge gas fees aren't, aren't really making yeah. it that desirable. Um, like, look, you, you're an NFT investor. Like, look at <laughs> NFTs. Um, like, the mint prices used to be around, what, like $40 in gas fees. Now it's like hundreds if, if it's like on a congested network um, yeah. at certain days or times, whatever. Um, and that's why I think we've seen people like move over to Solana and others as well, you know. Um, but like, if Ethereum merges on to the like beacon chain this year, um, which they say they are, which then um, uses proof of stake over proof of work, then we might see a dip in gas fees and it may become more desirable. The, uh, the thing is, obviously, the entire decentralized finance system pretty much is built on Ethereum. But yeah, I think that if I was to look at crypto, I would say yeah, um, gaming and layer ones, um, would be the forefront just because you can still sleep at night if you you, know, you can go a little bit further out and a bit riskier in in gaming because it's very um, you know it's a lot of speculation there. But if you stick with the the layer ones, I think you know regardless of what happens in the market and the swings, I think that at least you can sleep at night because stuff like Solana, Polkadot, Terra Luna, I don't think they're going anywhere. So yeah, you definitely understand your um, risk appetite. <laughs> Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you. And, you know, I suppose that kind of brings us uh, kind of towards the end of the podcast. I think, yeah, what you said about ETH. I mean, I just, I don't bother with ETH NFTs because I, I just can't be bothered. Even like the DeFi stuff we were looking at like months ago, I remember it just took me weeks and weeks to get to the point where I could transfer it. And then it was like, how much? You paid a lot of gas on one of your ones in Olympus or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, the prince, it's like the modern method of auction in property people. You don't want to pay six grand to these dickhead agents. Although it's just a principle. It's like, oh, this is so dumb. Um, and you lose half your investment before you fucking put it in. You're like, well, it needs to be crypto now to, to make it back. Um, so, you know, for everyone listening, I work with D probably in a multitude of ways. You're, you're a key mm. supplier at the property event. I'm part of your 5D Mastermind 5AM club. I have to say, people, 5D Mastermind, it's made me money like hundreds of percents of money and to be honest i haven't really done anything i've just mm. kind of said the <laughs> <what I do. laughs> um, and you know this this is literally what happened so i'll put a link in the show notes here for you to go and take a look at the 5d and the 5am club um because both epic and not just crypto you're like stock options um you've got like we're talking about rare metals um mm. you've got like mindset some guy who's like boys with elon musk they go to like, the pub <laughs> together and sh like so you've got some really really cool yeah. guests on there we also um, got this so really good value. branding speaker that spoke on there as well oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 he was pretty yeah. good um so. yeah he's all right he's all right he's <laughs> quite bright colors he likes to wear um <laughs> So I definitely recommend people go check that out and yeah. sign up to that. And then, of course, we're working on the M&A stuff. I've got my first meeting tomorrow with a um, with an owner of a business. And again, this is all just from what D has taught. Um, so, 
yeah just you know big up d and thanks d for for sharing all of this with me and being a part of it and the community is good as well right yeah, um I think so you know we've got people like nana who just don't stop talking because <laughs> <laughs> i know he's listening to this um they always they always add value and add something so i'll add yeah. all of your notes um Appreciate and everything it. and also you mentioned nexo i'll add a link to nexo um and some of the masari and some of the other platforms cool. that you mentioned below to this um but d what is the best place what is the one place people can go to find you um, I would say Instagram because Linktree has got everything. But make sure it's the right Instagram though. I never, oh, just, man. Just, just because I know you've got a good amount of listeners, look, I will never DM you saying I've got trading bots and earn you hundreds of percent. I will never do that. My Instagram is D E E underscore L U D L O W. If you could put down the show notes, the real one, Tej, because yeah, I've, um, it's funny, just before we wrap up, I remember Shaz, good friend of ours, was at uh, a networking event. I think it was your networking event. And someone came up to him and he said, oh, uh, you know, you're going to D's event um, in Birmingham. He's like, I, I don't get a good vibe from that guy. He keeps asking me for money for trading. And <laughs> Shaz is like, no, nah, that's not his profile. So yeah, it's, uh, luckily we got boys like Shaz um, that can can step in there. But yeah, it's, uh, oh, Instagram needs to sort it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't i mean you and alfred like it's you know what it's, it's you wealthy good looking people and you just <laughs> get less so many fake like my mentee messaged me he's like tej like why is d trying to sell me this and i was like d doesn't even sell his actual <laughs> shit like he ain't gonna sell you some other random shit like, um but yeah I'll, I'll put a note in and if anyone's listening and they're not yeah. sure if it's d send me a message and i'll let you know but you'll know if it's him because of what he's like so yeah d thank you so much for coming on the podcast i appreciate the invitation 